Legend of Tidal here, and today we're doing another tier list using Tier Maker, this time covering the defeat traits of every single legendary lord in Total War Warhammer 2. So this is the trait that you would obtain for your lord uh, over a victory over any of these uh, particular legendary lords. So there's a lot to go through here. I think there's 70 legendary lords if we also include Gotrek. And uh, let's just get through it. Okay, so we're just going to rank them from S tier to D tier. S tier being... Uh, Traits that are going to be useful for pretty much every single legendary lord. D traits, useless for practically everyone. So there's some traits that, when you obtain it, it's only going to benefit some characters. So I'll talk just a briefly about um, how useful some of these traits are, based on you know current metas of uh, Total War Warhammer 2. Okay, so I've got a list on the, uh, on the other monitor there that I'll be looking at every now and again. Uh, just to make sure I get my facts checked, because I can't memorize every last little detail here. It's simply too many things. All right, so the first one, uh, we're going to be covering the High Elves first, is Ulth 1 Undefended, which is the defeat trait for Tyrion, which provides two melee attack for the Lord's Army and recruit rank plus one. Now, that is only going to be useful if you're using melee forces. So if you're using an Archer Army, it will boost their stats a little bit, but giving... Uh, melee attack to archer based armies is not necessary. So this is going to be very useful for factions like Warriors of Chaos, Norska, uh, Vampire Counts, anything that's really melee focused. So this one here, I'm going to put it at A tier because it is a really good trait. Two melee attack is definitely useful, but it's not useful universally for everyone. The next one is Techless, which is Ruin Unrestrained, which provides Winds of Magic Power Reserve plus 10 for Lord's Army. So this one over here, I'm also going to put it at 8 here, because this is useful provided you've got a Spellcaster. So basically, everybody can make use of this except for the Dwarfs. Unfortunate for them, because they're the only ones that don't have access to Winds of Magic. Next one is Alariel the Ever Queen, uh, and hers is called the Never Queen, and it provides plus four public order in the local province, Winds of Magic Power Reserve plus five, and Growth plus ten. I'm also going to put this at A, because those are very useful traits for sure, but I just don't think it reaches the S tier. It isn't going to help any, uh, it's not going to help much for Horde-based factions, uh, but I imagine that it would help the uh, the dwarves a fair bit with that extra growth because they are a slow growth faction, and the public order can help every everyone except for horde factions. So it's a good trait overall, um, all around. Uh, next up is Shadows Fall, which is a Lithanas trait. Uh, it provides hero action cost minus fifteen in the local region, hero action success chance plus ten percent in the local region. Uh, this one here, I'm going to say, uh, is a B-ranked trait. Definitely useful if you're keeping agents around the, the lord that um, that defeated Elithanar, but that's not always the case. And using that lord to escort um, agents around is not really a cost-effective way to go about it. So, I just feel like that one's a B-tier. It's, it's, it's good, but I very rarely make use of it nor do I really need to make use of it a lot of the time. Uh, next up is Mist Piercer, which is Eltharian's trait, uh, which provides missile resistance and charge defense versus large. Now, I don't think the charge defense versus large is particularly important for any particular lord, but the missile resistance is pretty much universally useful for every single legendary lord in the game, because at some point, you're going to get shot, unless you're playing something like Katep, where he's just getting getting kept way back and just isn't going anywhere near the, the front line, because he's essentially an artillery piece, um, I'm going to put this one here at S tier, because everybody can make use of Missile Resistance. It's just a really good stat to have on all of your Legendary Lords, or just all of your Lords in general, because even your Wizards or your Melee Lords, everybody gets shot. Okay, the next one is Dragon Slayer, which is Imric's trait. This provides a bonus versus large plus 10 and fire resistance. There's no downside to this, but it's really um, only useful for melee lords. The uh, The fire resistance is good as well, but you, you do encounter a bit of fire in the game, uh, but it's not critical that you have that uh, fire resistance. I'd imagine this is going to be most useful for lords that start with the regen trait, such as Throg. Uh, getting some extra bonus versus large is very useful on that. So basically what the, the bonus versus large does is gives you extra melee attack when fighting against large opponents. So 
higher chance to hit and also increases the amount of damage. So I'm going to put this one here at A tier. Definitely not critical, but at the same time, you're... <laughs> Imric very rarely survives these campaigns, um, so you're not going to be able to get that too often, unless you really get there quick and keep him alive. Next up, we have Lizardman defeat traits. Saurus Smiter, which is uh, Krokgar's trait, uh, Public Order plus two, and Melee Defense plus two. This is universally useful for any Lord, even if you're a spellcaster, because... Unless you're, like, perfect at keeping them out of combat, that melee defense will be very useful when somebody is trying to hunt you down. And then, of course, public order plus two in or in, in the region that they're in. Very useful. Akin to uh, the um, the stat buff from Alariel, although she provides plus four. Now, this one here, I'm actually going to put at S tier because everybody can make use of a bit of extra melee defense. It'll just keep your lord alive um, significantly. A 10% extra chance to evade any particular melee hit is really useful, so that's a very sought-after trait. Next up is Spawn Killer, which is Mazda Mundi's defeat trait. This provides Leadership Aura plus 25%. This is garbage. This is one of the worst traits in the game, because the Leadership Aura size, that only affects the, 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 the actual leadership. This isn't a increase of aura of like the Mortis Engine effect. It's just for leadership. Now, a lot of the times in this game, your Lords will be out doing other things rather than keeping your army together. And since Warhammer 2 in general is a fairly high leadership uh, faction, uh, it's a high leadership game, uh, as in most units don't break like at the, sl at the slightest sound of a scary m uh, noise or something. Uh, most units will stand and fight for a fair bit, even if you're playing on the highest difficulties. So this trait here is going to be way more useful for low leadership factions, such as Bretonia, but they are already... They've got plenty of things going for them, so it's hardly necessary. I, I try to get rid of Master Mundi as quickly as possible, just so I don't have to have that trait, so it doesn't take up a trait slot, because you can only have a certain number of them before your uh, Lord will stop picking up new traits. Alright, next one is... Uh, Tic-Tac-Toe, Out of the Skies, it's called. Uh, this provides campaign movement range plus 10%, campaign line of sight plus 10%. This is universally useful, and one of the best defeat traits in the game. It goes in the S tier, taking out... Tic-tac-toe with your lords is so useful because campaign movement range is just universally useful. Being able to move your character further on the campaign every single turn, there is no downside to that whatsoever, and every single legendary lord uh, can make use of it. Okay, after that we've got Prophet of Doom, which is Tehenowin's defeat trait, which provides casualties captured post-battle plus 15%, and untainted in the local province. So... I think, I think it's supposed to be, um, uh, not necessarily untainted, but your favored corruption in the local province. So if you're playing as Chaos and you defeat Tehenowin, I think it does that, but I'm not entirely sure. I just recall that that was the case and they fixed it. Now, Casualties Captured post-battle is universally useful uh, because it allows you post-battle options, either taking more money, uh, getting more replenishment, whatever. So this is a good defeat trait, so it's going under A tier. Not totally amazing because the impact of it is not massive it's probably going to make the biggest effect for dark elves because they really want to capture as many uh, post-battle um units as possible so that they can uh, increase their slaves um but it's universally useful for all factions so it goes under a tier there uh next up wanderer no more which is the nakai defeat trait which provides bonus versus large and melee defense plus 10. so this one here is very much akin to uh, Krokgar's traits very similar, the, the melee defense plus 10, but uh, the bonus versus large makes them a better defeat trait for a melee focused lord. So this one here is also going under S tier, despite the fact, of course, Nakai himself being a garbage legendary lord, his defeat trait is very sought after. Very good if you get manage to get both of these for 20 extra melee defense. Even for your wizards, it'll make them a lot tankier, just in case you get caught by something. Uh, after that, we've got Movable Mountain, which is Krokgar's, sorry, sorry, Gorok's defeat trait, uh, which provides um, leadership plus four for the Lord's army and expert charge defense. So this one here is useful, but not that good. I would imagine that this is mostly useful for low leadership factions, such as Bretonia, as for um, any, any vampire or un undead faction, because you really want to keep their uh, leadership as high as possible so they don't crumble. Uh, but also, if you want to be using Grimgore's 
um, the immortals because that extra leadership will make the immortals essentially immortal for just that little bit longer. So it's very useful. So I'm going to put this one here under B tier because there's a lot of factions that just aren't really going to make that much use out of that. Uh, then the next one here is Oxyodal. Now this one here isn't actually present on this list as in on the, 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 the list that I can see here. Uh, so I can't remember exactly what the defeat trait is called, but I know exactly what it does. Uh, it provides Vanguard deployment for your Lord. This is okay, uh, but hardly particularly impactful. So I'm going to put it under C tier. Not that great of a defeat trait. Okay, next up is the Dark Elves. So, first up we've got Malekith, which is Immortal Unbeloved, which provides income from raiding 10% and passive ability frenzy. So, the income from raiding is almost useless for most races in the game, or a lot of the races in the game. So, High Elves and Lizardmen, for the most part, can't raid at all, unless we're playing as Nagareth. You can't raid at all, so that income from raiding is completely useless. A lot of factions also don't really... It just don't benefit at all from raiding. So, for example, the Empire and Dwarves, they don't make, they just make jack shit from raiding anyway. So, an extra 10% on jack shit just isn't worth much. The factions that are going to make use of this are Greenskins and Norska, and with maybe a few exceptions, uh, the Warriors of Chaos, because they do make a lot of money from raiding, and they can go into raid stance without, without any movement remaining. So, the other one, of course, being Frenzy. Frenzy's alright, it's only really going to benefit um, melee lords. I'm going to put this one here as a B tier, because it just doesn't really benefit a lot of different uh, potential lord types, or even races for that matter, so it's just an okay defeat trait. Uh, next up, we've got Hag Butcher, which is Marathi's defeat trait. Now, this one here provides hero action cost minus 10% for all he heroes, so it's a global bonus, and heroes self-defense chance plus 10% chance of wounding aggressors heroes in the local province. So this defeat trait here is really sort of weird. This is one of the best defeat traits for the High Elves because they rely so heavily on their agent actions. It's also really good for greenskins. It's really great for everybody. But a lot of races don't really make a lot of use out of their their hero actions, so it's not universally useful for everyone, but it's super useful for the High Elves. So I'm going to put this under A tier, but just keep in mind that this is one of the most sought out traits for High Elves. It's just for all the other races. So for example, if you're playing as Warriors of Chaos, this is just crap. It just doesn't matter at all because you're just very rarely even doing agent actions. Uh, green skins do make very good use out of the block agent um, action. Uh, same thing with Skaven with their chieftains. So getting her with some races is way better than it is with others. Okay, after that, we got Hellebron's uh, defeat trait, which is the day after, which provides armor-piercing weapon damage plus 20 and melee attack plus 5. So this one here does, you know, boost melee stats by a fair bit, sort of akin to the, uh, the Krokgar and Nakai trait. However, um, this is only beneficial for actual melee lords. If you've got a wizard lord, generally speaking, you don't want that wizard lord or, or ranged lord to be in combat. So the melee attack isn't particularly useful for them. Whereas melee defense is useful because sometimes you just get attacked, right? And if something's got a low weapon strength, it's not really going to help that much. And plus 20 extra armor pierce and weapon damage, while that's good, it's not that much especially considering most lords have hundreds if not thousands of weapon strength so this one here useful useful to just get those stats up but not that useful so i'm going to put it under a tier there next up is lockyer felhart which is black arc down this one here provides immune to storm and reef attrition um it's okay, I mean, if you're sailing around with the Lord, that will be useful, and, you know, a storm comes through, you just don't have to worry about taking attrition. But that being said, most of the time, that amount of attrition isn't really that high, unless you're, like, sitting around there for a really long time. So I'm actually going to put this one at B tier. It's useful for everyone, just not useful very often, so that's why we put it under there. Next up is um, Malice in Underworld, which provides armor-piercing weapon damage plus 30. So... It's similar to Hellebrons, provides 50% extra weapon damage, armor-piercing weapon damage, but without the melee attack. I'd say this one here is pretty similar, but without the melee attack, I just, I feel like 
5 extra melee attack is actually way more valuable than 30 extra weapons damage, I'm a piercing, sorry. So I'm actually going to put that one at B tier, just because I, I just really feel like this one here is better across the board for all, all lords, whereas this one here just doesn't really benefit anyone that much. Just not, not a particularly good trait. Uh, but B, uh, B tier is like sort of mediocre trait. Then we've got Beast Master of None, which is Rakath's defeat trait, which provides bonus versus large plus 8, and leadership minus 5 for enemy monstrous units, local enemy armies. So this is, can be an interesting one, because if you, um, if you get this trait multiple times, and then with multiple different lords, and then use those multiple lords to march on a Rite of Primeval Glory army, for example, you will just terrify them. But that is such a rare occurrence that it's almost not even worth mentioning. Uh, generally speaking, if you're playing on Legendary difficulty, that um, you're probably not going to want to put four lords all together, unless you're playing as Bretonia or the Vampire account. But the bonus versus large is very good, especially for melee-focused lords. Uh, I, once again, I'm going to put this one here at B tier, just because it's not universally useful. Uh, a lot of legendary, a lot of lords just aren't really going to make use of that trait. But it's not bad. Not like these ones here. Okay, next up, we're going to Skaven. Alright, we got Vermin Flail. This one here provides bonus Vernus infantry. It says here plus 6, but I believe they changed that to plus 10 now. So this... This list that I'm reading here, I think, is a little bit old. Um, I remember back in the day, I made a list uh, of worst defeat traits, and I think I put Queeks on there. Um, but I think, in hindsight, it's probably a little bit better than what I mentioned. So, bonus versus infantry is like the opposite of bonus versus large. When you're going up against small entities, um, you get a extra melee attack bonus. So, in this case here, it would be a melee attack bonus of, of 10. Um, and also provide a little bit of extra weapon strength. So, comparing that to Hellebron, Hellebron just provides a flat bonus of 5, regardless of whatever she's fighting. And this one here, providing 10, provided you're going up against infantry. Now, there are, I think, more t often times you will go up against infantry or small units than large units, especially in the early stages of the campaign. But I just don't feel like Queek's trait is that useful. Uh, if you're going to make it like a one-man doomstack, it could be good. But just keep in mind, if you get this one, then you're missing out on something else because there's a limit to how many you can get. I'd say this one is definitely under the non-essential category. So I'm going to put it under C tier. I just don't think it's particularly useful on its own. Um, but if it was like giving plus one um, bonus versus infantry for the entire army, that would be a different story. Okay, next up is Lord Skrulk's trait, which is called Plague Lash. Um, this one here, immune to swamp attrition, and provides minus five public order in local enemy province. Uh, swamp attrition is not that big of a deal. There's barely any swamps in the game, uh, mostly confined to Lustria. And even when you do walk through them, you barely take any damage, even if you have no attrition uh, modifiers. And minus five public order in local enemy province is useless. Causing revolts in enemy settlements is one of the most ineffective ways to play in the game. I'd say that Lord Skrulk's defeat trait belongs under D tier. It's just not that good. You're just very rarely going to make use out of it. Now, next up is Tretch's defeat trait, which is Craven by name. Now, Tretch is a terrible legendary lord, but his defeat trait is actually fairly useful. Provides speed plus 12%. And then leadership plus four during subterranean intercept battles, which that's not very useful for a lot of. Um, that's for the Lord's army as well. Um, it's not. It's it's okay. It depends on what faction you're playing as, I suppose. I mean, if you're playing as vampire counts, um, that's only when you're intercepting other other armies, I suppose. But the speed plus twelve percent is pretty much universally useful for your lords. But we got to keep in mind that every single unit in this game has a actual speed cap. I don't know exactly what it is, but it, it feels as if it's roughly 50% of what their base speed is, depending on their mount as well. Um, but I do think it's a very good uh, defeat trait. Very useful for lords that need to zip around the map very quickly, such as wizards. So I'm going to actually put this one under B tier. Um, mainly just for the speed. Speed is very useful. It's one of the best or most underrated stats in the game. It's really good to move your uh, your lords around quickly. Next up is Ikat Claw, which is a fitting end, which provide Winds of Magic Power Reserve plus 10 and Research Rate plus 10% faction-wide. Uh, I don't know why it says faction-wide. I mean, plus 10%, whatever, it doesn't matter. 
Anyway, uh, this one here is an S tier defeat trade because even if you're playing as dwarfs and you don't need the Winds of Magic Power Reserve, which is good for every other race for sure, uh, the research rate plus 10%. If you do this with multiple lords, you can get through your research fairly quickly. Now, there are some races that are going to benefit from that more than others. So, for example, the High Elves, pro while they're, they won't benefit from the research rate quite as much because they have ways of massively increasing their research rate fairly early on. Uh, but the Winds of Magic Power Reserve, for example, they're really going to make use of that because they don't get the knowledgeable trait. So, uh, Ica Claw is a defeat trait for everybody. It's a very good one. Uh, everyone's going to benefit from it. Next up, we've got Deathmaster Snitch, which is Hero Action Success Chance plus 4% in the local region and a Tribute Stalk. So, Hero Action Success Chance plus 4% is good. Stalk is bad for your lords. Generally speaking, you want the enemy to know where your lords are. Um, it's actually really bad if your lord can't be seen by the enemy. It's usually the, what you want to be doing is hide your, your, most of your army and just have your lord be seen. Especially if your lord is on like a very fast mount and you want to lure them away. By forcing this uh, lord to hide constantly, it means you have to get in really close in order to get the enemy's attention. And oftentimes that means getting into the range of bullets. This is actually a bad defeat trait in most cases, and oftentimes I try to avoid getting this defeat trait because it's so tactically fucking stupid. So that goes under D tier. It's so very rare that you actually want your Lord to hide permanently on a battle because usually you can use it as a beacon to, to make the enemy do a stupid maneuver. Uh, but yeah, very, very bad defeat trait there. Next up is Deep Cleaner, which is Throt's Defeat Trade. Real simple, this one provides hit points plus 10% for the Lord. This is universally useful. Everybody benefits from more hit points. There is nobody that's like, oh, I wish I had less hit points. More hit points also means more maximum regen. So pairing this up with Isabella's Defeat Trade is really good. So this one here goes under S tier. Really good if you're trying to make your Lord a super strong individual fighter. Really, really good uh, Defeat Trade there. Next up, we've got Vampire Coast one. So, uh, Luther Harkon, one down, X to go. This defeat trait provides magic resistance plus 15% and leadership when fighting at sea. So, that leadership is only for the Lord. So, I don't think that's particularly useful, that the leadership part. But the magic resistance, that's universally useful for everybody. So, I'm going to put this one here at A tier because there's definitely a loads of different ways to get magic resistance on your lords. And it's possible to get, for every single lord in the game, uh, the magic resistance cap without ever touching Luther Harkon. But, you know, if you get Luther Harkons, you may not need to get the other ones. But that is a very good defeat trait, but not worthy of S tier. Just because it's there's so many other ways to get magic resistance. Next up, we've got the Dreadfleet Drowned, which is Noctifless's uh, defeat trait. This one here provides uh, plus five leadership when fighting against Vampire Coast, and plus five leadership when fighting against the sea. All of this is for the Lord's Army. So that's okay. The, the leadership plus five when fighting against Vampire Coast, that's useful because all undead units have the Fear trait, which is a minus eight um, leadership penalty, as long as they're actually susceptible to uh, fear, but this does have quite a low impact because a lot of the time Vampire Coast do use a lot of missile units, so they actually will keep a lot of their troops back. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them. But if you're going up against a lot of depth guard, it can be quite useful. I'm going to put this one here under C tier, just because I don't really see this one as being particularly useful, because I think the Vampire Coast is actually one of the easier races in the game to beat on the battlefield, and they're usually one of the first races to become extinct. So they're just not that much of a threat, so getting a bit of extra leadership on them, just I just don't feel like is that much of a threat. Okay, next up we've got uh, Consigned to the Drink, which is Araness's defeat trait. This one here provides income from sacking settlements plus 15%, passive ability, regeneration when fighting at sea. So only when they're out at sea does the Lord, not the army, get um, extra, extra the, uh, the regeneration trait. So the income from sacking settlements... Um, that's useful for races that are actually going to sack settlements, so not going to be useful for High Elves. Uh, could be useful for Bretonia because they make tons of money from sacking settlements, even at the cost of, um, of, um, 
chivalry uh really useful for green skins probably not that useful for dwarfs and empire and you know various other races if you want to go through them all um i'm gonna put this one here under b tier it's not bad it's a good defeat trait um every single lord in the game can sack oh actually that's not true um beastmen and warriors of chaos can't sack settlements so they because they can only uh blow up settlements so they can't make use of that part, but they can make use of the uh, defeat trait. Um, uh, sorry, the um, the regeneration, at least at C. So, eh, borderline C tier trait there, but it is quite useful, I guess. Okay, next one is Siren Extinguish, which is Silostra's uh, defeat trait. Um, I believe they actually changed this a little bit. It used to be one of the only defeat traits that provided, like, uh, like a malice. It used to give you... Um, like increase your miscast base chance, but now they actually reduced it to um, miscast ch base chance minus 5%. It also provides Winds of Magic starting amount plus 15, Lord's Army. This is really useful for players like me that always end up gambling and getting less Winds of Magic. So if you start off with 15 extra, you just never need to gamble. Um, and then enemy Winds of Magic starting amount minus 10. So this one here, fairly useful defeat trade, not useful at all for uh, dwarves really, apart from the enemy wins of magic starting amount, minus 10. Um, so I'm going to put this one here under B tier. It used to be, I think, one of the worst traits in the game, but they, they changed it a little bit. All right, that's the Vampire Coast. Let's move on now to Tomb Kings. We've got Cetra's defeat trait, which is Cetra the Perishable, which provides plus 15 charge bonus. And public order minus three to local enemy province. Now, I believe there's a trait that you can get for Sertha Ek, the Norskan leader of the Varg tribe, that's different, which provides a huge bonus to chariots. But I'm not going to take that into consideration because that's super difficult to get. Um, and it's just, this is not really worth uh, worrying about at all because chariots, even with that bonus, aren't Norska's best units if, by a long shot. So it's not really even worth getting. Uh, but yeah, the charge bonus plus 15, public order minus 3. Uh, the, the public order is not useful at all. As I said with Skrulk, um, trying to cause revolts in enemy provinces, that's only particularly useful if you're trying to revive factions. And the thing is, you, you should use heroes to do that, not lords. So any any hero that has a bonus to public order, so for example, if you're playing High Elves, the Law Master of Hoeth, it provides a bonus to public order. It equally provides a negative to public order with um, enemy provinces. So you just like put 20 of them in an enemy province if you want to cause it to revolt to bring back a faction. But yeah, putting your lords inside of a region to cause a revolt is a huge waste of a supply line. So I'm going to say that Cetras is definitely a C tier because the charge bonus is useful only if they're a melee focused lord. So if you're using a wizard on like a Pegasus mount, it's not useful at all. So sparsely useful uh, uh, defeat trait there. Next up, we have Katep, which is not so grand Hierophant. It provides Winds of Magic Power Reserve plus 15, Lord's Army, immune to Desert Attrition, Lord's Army, and immune to Sandstorm Attrition. So this defeat trait here is really useful for any spellcasters in that particular army because it provides the biggest amount of Winds of Magic Power Reserve. That's a, that's a decent amount. Also, there is quite a lot of areas in, in the game, especially in the south, that has desert areas and a lot of races in the game are not immune to uh, desert attrition and the immunity to stand sandstorm attrition is particularly useful because tomb kings like to create sandstorms so i'm going to put this one here at a tier because i think it is really good um but it's not useful for everyone and there are other ways to get winds of magic with the exception of maybe high elves so that's probably the high elves will make the most use out of that but i just don't i think it borderlines s tier but just doesn't quite make it just because there's other ways to get winds of magic power reserve without having to get him so it's not something that you absolutely essentially have to farm next up is arkan the blacks defeat trait which is called arkan the blackened this provides Diplomatic Relations plus 20 with Tomb Kings and Weapon Strength plus 25 when fighting against Vampire Counts. That's just for the Lord there. I'd say that this one here is not particularly useful. I'm actually going to put it under C tier because Diplomatic Relations plus 20 with Tomb Kings is not needed because t most, well, actually all Tomb Kings will like you more as the campaign progresses because Great Power Penalty actually works in reverse for them. It becomes Great Power Bonus. So the stronger you are, the better it becomes. So 
Tomb Kings are usually very reasonable to negotiate with. It, with the exception of the Vortex campaign, I've noticed that Cetra can just break treaties whenever he feels like it and just declare war on you. Um, but yeah, if you're playing a particularly hated race, then maybe defeating Ark and the Black multiple times is fairly useful. So, for example, Skaven. Everybody hates the Skaven or the Beastmen. Um, but that being said, with those particular races, you don't need to be diplomatically friendly with anyone. So it's just not an essential thing for um, to, to defeat uh, Ark and the Black. Next up is Kalida the Never... Uh, her trait is called Kalida the Never Living. No, Kalida Never Living, right? And this provides diplomatic relations plus 30 with vampire accounts and also recruit rank plus 2 for missile units. So this is very similar to Ark and the Blacks. It's also going to get uh, C tier. It's just really rare that you would ever really want to do deals with vampire accounts. For one thing, they hate most races anyway. they got a huge aversion to everyone. Uh, but you'd have to get it multiple times. And even if you did uh, get good relations with the vampire accounts they're usually one of the first races to become extinct so it's just not particularly useful and yeah the recruit rank plus two for missile units it's just just not that useful so c tier for kalida now let's move on to the empire's defeat traits so we got reich's hammer which is carl franz's defeat trait which it causes a tribute uh causes terror when fighting against the empire this is Shit! Absolute garbage. Uh, for defeating essentially the main character of Warhammer 2, this is total crap. Most lords in this game have the ability to cause terror by default at some point in their skill tree, either by a mount. So, you know, if you're on a hippogriff, an eagle mount, a dragon mount, some lords just cause terror by default, such as Throg. I think he causes terror. So, getting terror only when fighting against the Empire is so specific and so redundant, it's just a garbage defeat trait. You just never ever need to get this defeat trait. It's crap. Uh, next up is Volkmar's defeat trait. Uh, Grimsbane provides melee defense plus three for melee infantry units in the Lord's Army and plus three melee attack for melee infantry in the Lord's Army. So this is particularly useful for melee infantry focused factions so norse early game norska early game warriors of chaos um anytime vampire accounts and then depending on how you play greenskins or other races in terms of their um their stats it could be very useful for the dwarves as well because they should use uh defensive infantry like iron breakers throughout their campaign so there are some races that just aren't going to make use of this at all for example the high elves that have you just you don't you can get their melee infantry they're okay it's just that you've got vastly better choices um so i'd say this one here is a b tier trait but it is really good for some factions so really really good for vampire accounts um but iffy for the other ones uh, because yeah with vampire accounts going melee infantry is sort of the meta at the moment Okay, then we've got Metal Storm, which is Balthazar, Balthazar Gelt's trait. This one here provides armor plus six for all units in the Lord's Army. Now, armor is universally useful. The problem here is that plus six is just not very much. So that is the equivalent of three to six percent damage reduction of non-armor piercing damage. And armor piercing damage is way more dangerous, obviously, than, than uh, regular damage. So... If it was a higher amount, I would rate this a bit higher, but I'm going to put this under B, because it is useful for everybody. Armor is not bad, it doesn't slow you down um, at all, it doesn't affect your speed stat. Um, it's just not that much, that's all. I mean, at least it affects your entire army, so I'm going to put it under B tier there. Uh, next up is Hunted Down, which is Marcus Wolfhart's defeat trait, which provides missile resistance plus 10% and missile damage plus 5% for the Lord's Army. This one here goes to S tier. Now, there are some factions that don't make use of... Well, hang on. Don't make use of the missile damage, right? So, Warriors of Chaos, as an example, or maybe the Lizardmen, don't really make that much use out of missile damage, or vampire counts, for that matter. Uh, but every single faction in the game can make use of missile resistance, because at some point, your lord is going to receive a bullet in the face. So, missile resistance plus 10%, you know, akin to Eltharian's defeat trait, where is he? And he's an S tier one as well. Um, but yeah, missile damage plus 5% is super useful for any factions that are you can use any sort of missile units, which is the vast majority of them. So very good defeat trait, arguably better than Altharians by a tiny little amount. 
Okay, so that's the Empire. Let's move on to Dwarf Defeat Traits. First up, we have Thorgrim Grudgebearer. Uh, it's called the Grudge Killer Trait. Uh, and this one provides construction cost minus 10% for all buildings, local province, and research rate plus 10% faction-wide. So, just for the research rate alone, very, very useful. Construction cost minus 10%, very useful for specific factions if you want to have a particular lord that's got this trait to just pop in and out, sort of like how I use administrators with high elves. Um, I'm going to put this one here under A tier, just because... It, it is really good, for sure, but if we're going to compare it to Ikiklaus, who also provides research rate, I think that the Winds of Magic bonus that he provides is a bit better than the than the construction cost reduction um, for, um, for Thorgrim's defeat trade. It does borderline S tier, it's just, just doesn't quite reach it, only by a little bit, so I'm going to put it under A tier there. Uh, next up is Grombrindle's trait called Beardhammer, and this one here provides causes terror when fighting against dwarves, which is... Fucking garbage. It's the exact same trait uh, that Carl Fran uh, provides. It's just for the dwarves. Now, here's the thing. It's even worse than Carl Franz's because at least the Empire is kind of susceptible to terror because a lot of their units are relatively low leadership. Now, the thing is with dwarves is that they are in an extremely high leadership faction, so terror doesn't apply a lot of the time. You have to nearly obliterate a dwarf unit before, before terror can even be applied. And then, on top of that, of course, your lords can get terror by default against everyone, most lords. And then, there are a lot of um, ways in which dwarves are actually immune from psychology. So, for example, longbeards are just immune to psychology by default. So, this is an absolute fucking garbage trait. If it provided fear when fighting against dwarves, that'd be different. Because uh, fear, I think, is more useful than terror. But, even then, that would just be completely bloody useless. Okay, next up is Belagar Ironhammer's defeat trait called King Hammer. Provides leadership plus four during subterranean intercept battles. It seems to be that that's just for the Lord. And also provides melee attack during uh, uh, subterranean intercept battles. So these are, these are specifically when you're intercepted, not for subterranean battles, but when, when intercepted. So this is really, really, really niche, and it only applies to the Lord. This is going under D tier, because it just is so very rare to actually come into play, that it might as well just not even exist. Um, just such a low impact. Like, you might get through a couple of intercepts over the course of an entire campaign, and to make such a small use out of it. Like, what if your lord is a spellcaster? Who cares about that melee attack? And it's just not the deciding factor in, in most cases. It's just very, very low impact stat. Then we've got Ungram Iron Fist defeat trait, Slayer King Slayer, which provides plus five melee attack, plus 5 magic resistance, and plus 5 missile resistance. This one here is an A tier defeat trait. Really, really good. Not necessarily critical for everyone, because melee attack is not useful for spellcasters. It's only going to be useful for melee focused lords. But magic resistance and missile resistance is universally useful, because at some point, somebody's going to use a magic attack on you, and at some point, somebody's going to shoot you. They could be the same attack as well. So it is definitely akin to one of the best Dwarf Defeat traits, uh, and very useful if you're trying to make a one-man Doomstack. The only problem with it is that Ungram Iron Fist is usually such a pain in the ass to fight that <laughs> getting it can be troublesome, but it is a very good Defeat trait. Then we've got Thoric Ironbrow's Defeat trait called Old Grump Slayer. I'm kind of surprised that this one was on the list, but Oxyodles wasn't, because uh, they both were introduced at the same time, but anyway, it is here. Luckily, I remember what it was anyway. Uh, provided magic item drop chance plus 15% for the accompanying lord. Enemy winds of magic starting amount minus 10 for the lord's army. And armor piercing weapon damage plus 3 for the lord's army. So this one here provides a lot of bonuses. But a lot of this stuff is only really going to be useful for infantry based armies. Not necessarily melee infantry, but any kind of infantry. Because armor piercing weapon damage plus 3 on a carnosaur is next to nothing. But armor piercing weapon damage plus three on a gobbo is huge that like triples their armor piercing damage so it's the same sort of thing for archers if you run out of ammo at least you've got that armor piercing weapon damage and uh, magic item drop chance is very useful good to get more items so this one here i'm going to put under a tier but uh, it's definitely more useful for um Armies that are going to be coming in with bigger numbers and v much less useful for armies that are coming in with smaller numbers, like, for example, Lizardmen, uh, depending on how, of course, you're using your army. 
Um, it's just a late game with this meant tends to gravitate towards you know a lot of dinosaurs. Okay, so that's the dwarfs done. Let's move on now to the green skins. First up, we've got Hide Striker, which is Grimgore's defeat trait. Uh, it provides armor piercing weapon damage plus twenty and armor plus ten. So it's very similar to um, Malice Darkblade's defeat trait. Instead of providing plus thirty. It provides 20 and then provides a bit of extra armor. These are some fairly low numbers for a defeat trait. So I'm going to put this under B tier because it's pretty much exactly the same as Malice's defeat trait. Um, so yeah, that's why it's going under B tier there. I mean, it's just, it's just, I, it's practically identical. Uh, at least in terms of its function. Uh, then we've got Sneaky Smiter, which is uh, uh, Scar Snake's defeat trait, which provides ambush success chance plus 20%. Ambush defense chance plus 20% Lord's army. So this is really really useful for any faction that is either a Skaven faction or fighting Skaven factions or fighting beastmen. So really really good for beastmen as well. I'm not going to put it under S tier because it's not useful for everyone. I'm going to put it under A tier. So this is if you're playing as Skaven, you want to get this defeat trait. You want to farm this trait because ambush success chance is super useful. If you're playing as dwarfs, you want to uh, before you go and fight Skaven, you want to get this defeat trait because you want to get that ambush success chance down as much as possible. Um, but there are some factions that just don't need to worry about it at all. For example, Lizardmen. Uh, it almost doesn't even matter if Lizardmen get ambushed there. They're just not really susceptible to it. Same sort of thing with Warriors of Chaos. It just doesn't really hurt them that much. So they just... Oh, and uh, the Warriors of Chaos can't ambush people. So they just don't need to get uh, Scar Snake's defeat trait. Very useful for the Empire. Um, and, you know, various other factions. So good good defeat trait, but not S tier. Because it doesn't. it's not universally needed. Alright, next up we've got Great Green Killer. Which is Wurzag's defeat trait. Oh my god, still so many. Uh, this providing a physical resistance buff of 10%. This is universally useful. Everybody wants to make use of this. In fact, it's one of the most critical defeat traits to get if you want your Lord to become a one-man doomstack, because this is the only instance of getting a trait that provides physical resistance. There's loads of ways to get magic resistance, but this is the only way to get physical. So this one here is actually going into S tier, because what it does is going to benefit everybody because at some point you're going to take physical damage uh regardless of you know how well you micro well unless you're really really good at it and um avoid combat but spellcasters you know if a if a non-magical bullet is in their face that 10 percent can really um really really help okay then we've got grom's defeat trait which is called weight watchers which provides diplomatic relation plus 10 with with high elves and causes terror when fighting against greenskins i think that provides it to the entire army uh, doesn't that change it to fear? Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, no, no, I think it's terror. Okay, so this one here is super, super useful for the high elves, and for anybody else that wants to make deals with high elves. So if you're playing as dark elves, this probably isn't really needed for you. It's useful for Bretonia, probably not useful for Skaven. So it has varying degrees of usefulness. But so good for uh, High Elves. It's one of the traits that I beeline straight for when playing as High Elves. And in my current campaign of, um, of uh, Etain, um, I think I got this trait eight times over the course of a few turns. And it just made all of my diplomatic deals with all of the High Elves so much easier. So I'm going to put this one under A tier. Because it is really good. But also it's kind of difficult to get long term. Because Grom usually ends up dead. Unless you start playing as Eltharion. Because he has a different start position. Uh, next up is Green Skinner, which is Azag's defeat trait, and this one here provides magic resistance plus 30%. 30% is a huge buff to uh, magic resistance. Uh, it's one of the, yeah, it's actually one of the biggest buffs in the game for uh, resistance. Now there are plenty of other ways to get magic resistance in the game, and you can probably get to maximum magic resistance even without it. But this is definitely one of the better ways of getting it. So I'm going to put it under S tier. It's really useful. Um, getting Wurzag straight and Azag straight is essentially 10% ward save, which is really bloody good. Okay, now we move on to Vampire Counts. Moonslaker is the trait for um, Manfred von Karstein. Provides minus 50% casualties suffered from Vampire Counts attrition. Um, Lord's Army. This one here is not really that useful because there's loads of ways of, of 
preventing that attrition anyway. You don't take vampire attrition while moving through vampire territory, only if you end the turn while inside of a vampiric region or your own region that has above 50%. So usually you're okay for vampire attrition. It's just very, very occasionally it's useful. So this one here, I'm going to put it under C tier because if the vampires are extinct, you don't need it anymore. And even when fighting the vampires, you know, you can, can go into encamp states. As I said, you don't take vampiric attrition while moving through vampire territory. So it's just not that much of a threat. Okay, then we've got Gorst or Ghost, uh, which is Helm and Gorst's defeat trait, which enables poison attack. And it's just for the Lord. Now, sometimes that can be considered useful. A lot of Lords already have poison attack. Um, but I've always found that poison is fairly low impact. And it's only really going to be beneficial for um, Lords that are going into melee. So I'm going to put this one here under B tier because it's not bad to have just a, a straight up stat buff and everybody can make use of it, whether you're a spellcaster, a, an archer or a melee lord, but I just don't think it's very impactful. Sort of akin to Balthazar Gelt's, like it, good in theory, if it was just a little bit more, like if I gave it to the entire army, that would be good. But of course, that's his actual um, uh, lord trait, so you don't want to take the whole thing. Then we've got uh, Vlad defeat trait which is undeath descendant and he provides wood recovery time minus four now this is very useful for people that are constantly getting their legendary lords smashed um it's also really bad if particularly strong ai legendary lords get it such as luen leonkur you do not want to be fighting luen leonkur every single goddamn turn so this is a very good defeat trait if you suck at the game so <laughs> Uh, I mean, if you're really good at the game, your lords never get wounded, you never need to make use of it. But, since it's a good as a crutch, I'm going to put it as a B tier trait. It's really useful for the AI though, especially if you just really don't want to be seeing them very often. So, B tier trait for that one. Next up, we've got Cruelty Restrained, which is Isabella's von Karstein's um, defeat trait. This provides passive ability regeneration. It's one of the most sought after defeat traits in the game. Regeneration is universally needed um, because it just helps your lord to, you know, recover damage between uh, during battles. Um, there are some lords that already have regeneration capabilities, either in their skill tree or, or by default, or even through their mount options. Um, so anyone that already has regen, such as Throt the Unclean or um, Heinrich Kemmler, various others that have regeneration, like Marathi, just don't ever need to defeat uh, Isabella, but for the vast majority of generic lords, they can really make use of it. So this one here is going to go under S tier, because it's one of the best defeat traits in the game, because passive ability regeneration essentially provides your lord, so assuming they don't already have it, with 75% extra health. So that is significantly stronger than Throt's trait, but that's 75% extra health over the course of a battle. It's also very useful if your Lord is particularly smashed in one battle, like they, they have like 10 hit points left, and then they go into the next battle, but it's going to be super easy, and then they can actually heal in the battle as long as they don't get involved sort of thing. So very, very useful for just about every single uh, race in the game. Okay, next up we've got Heinrich Kemmler's uh, uh, trait, which is Lich Killer. Uh, this one here provides magic resistance plus 10% for the Lord's army. This one here also being one of the best defeat traits in the game, because not only does it provide magic resistance for your Lord, but for every single unit in your army. So that is definitely going to get an S tier trait there. That is arguably the best out of any of the magic resistant buffs, because it provides it to your entire army. Really, really good. Uh, I mean, as the Dwarfs, for example, they can really make use of it. You've got 25% magic resistance by default. You get that defeat trait. You're at 35%. You get the defeat trait. Sorry, not defeat trait. You build the Vault of Nagash. And then you've got an additional 10%. So you've got 45% on your army with that. And that's if you don't find any other bonuses to it. So really, really good defeat trait universally for everybody. Really, really good. Then we've got Norska. Right, first one is Blood Feuder, which is Wolfric the Wanderer's uh, trait. Um, it provides bonus versus infantry, plus 5, plus a charge bonus, plus 10%. So, very useful for units, uh, lords that have already a very hard, high charge bonus, but nothing particularly special. I think I'm going to put this one under B tier. It's definitely not critical for any of your, you know, one-man doom stacks. Then we've got the Throg defeat trait, uh, which is uh, Troll Hunter. 
This one here providing bonus versus life plus 15, weapon strength plus 3%. This one here is actually better than um, Wolf Rick's defeat trait, so I'm going to put that under A tier. It's really good, that one. Uh, well sought after for um, any you know, one-man doom stacks. Uh, and even if it's a spellcaster lord, you know, bonus versus life is definitely not bad. Okay, then there is a, a note here on Sirtha Rekt. Um, I don't have a card for it. I'm just going to mention it briefly. So this is only for uh, if Setra defeats Sirtha Ek. Uh, unit capacity plus 10 for skeleton chariots. Armor plus 10 for, for chariot units, Lord's Army. Just not particularly useful because skeleton chariots are some of the worst units in your roster. And plus 10 armor just isn't very impactful. Like I said before, it's just not worth engaging into it. That's really just flavor, but doesn't have a whole lot of impact. Okay, moving on to Bretonia, we've got... Uh, there's actually two traits associated with um, with Lewin Leonco. If you're playing as a Bretonian faction you can, and you defeat um, Lewin Leonco, you get a negative trait called Kingslayer, which gives charge bonus plus 10%, but also reduced recruitment... Sorry, increased recruitment cost for cavalry units for the Lord's Army. So that would obviously be a D trait. Now, it's very, very rare that you would ever need to actually get that trait, um, or, or should get that trait, but one of the things with it as well is that you can actually get rid of it by staying in a region and, and praying, so it's something that you can get rid of. Now, um, oh, hang on, that was the actual trait for, sorry, I got around the wrong way there. Kingslayer is the trait if you're playing as anyone other than a Bretonian um, and defeat uh, Lewin Leonco. It uh, provides charge bonus plus 10, plus reduced recruitment cost for cavalry units. Right, sorry, I had it around the wrong way there. The the defeat trait for um, Bretonians to defeat um, Lewin Leonco is Traitor, uh, which provides minus 50 chivalry, provides 20% extra weapon strength, but also increases the upkeep for the Lord's army by 10%. And you can get rid of that one. It's the only defeat trait you can get rid of by praying. Sorry, I had that one around the wrong way. My bad there. Now, as for the Traitor st uh, stat, that's obviously a a D-ranked trait, but since you're very unlikely to get that unless you're playing as Bretonia, actually not, you can't get it unless you're playing as Bretonia, the Kingslayer trait is, okay, it's not that great. I'm going to put that under B tier. It just, you know, re reduced cost for cavalry units. Most factions don't really benefit from the cavalry, and charge bonus plus 10 is, yeah, it's all right if, if you want to charge in. A lot of, a lot of uh, lords don't charge much. Uh, so, you know, not universally needed. Then we've got Hammer and Anvil, which is Alberic's defeat trait, which provides plus 15 melee attack when fighting at sea. Only for the Lord, not particularly useful. I'm going to put that under C tier, just because it's very rare to make use of it. And, you know, spellcasters aren't going to make use of it at all. Then we've got uh, Witchfinder General, which is the Fey Enchantress's defeat trait. This one here provides casualty replenishment rate plus 10%. This is an S tier defeat trait, one of the best in the game. Now, this is particularly useful if you're playing as Bretonia, because Bretonia has pretty much no way of increasing their replenishment rate. So, pounding down on the Fey Enchantress with all of your lords can be really useful. Now, when you're playing as the Fey Enchantress, what you can do is deliberately lose to Alberic and Luan Leonco to give them your trait and then confederate them. But yeah, the only person who can't actually get the Fey Enchantress's defeat trait is the Fey Enchantress. But the thing is, if you if you start playing as her, then at least you, um, you have 15% extra um, casualty replenishment rate just as your faction trait. So um, that's how she's sort of compensated for it. But really, really useful defeat trait. There is a caveat to that, though. That type of replenishment requires you to be in friendly territory. So if you're playing as the Warriors of Chaos, for example, if you're out in encamp mode, it actually doesn't apply to that because that is constant attrition. Uh, sorry, not constant attrition, constant replenishment, and it's two separate types. So in order for the Warriors of Chaos to make use of that replenishment, they actually have to go into a vassal or allied territory in order to get that plus 10%. But that being said, Warriors of Chaos pretty much always have, well, not always, but once they finish their tech tree, they get pretty much 50% replenishment anyway, so they actually don't need it. But every other race in the game pretty much can make use of it. A really, really good defeat trait there. And then we've got End of an Errant, which is Repartz's defeat trait, which provides growth plus 5 in the local province, double experience gained for units when fighting against Bretonia, and research rate plus 5% faction-wide. This is really, really useful for Tomb Kings because of that research rate. They need that critically. Also, the growth is very useful. Uh, I'm going to put this one here as an A tier defeat trait because it is really good, but I just don't think it really hits the S tier because it's sort of similar to Alariel's defeat trait. Um, 
and uh, Ikaclaw provides double. Oh, so Ikaclaw and um, and uh, Thorgrim actually provide double the research rate. So I'm going to put it under A tier there. Uh, next up, we've got Wood Elf defeat traits. We've got uh, let's see. We'll start with Wild Hunter, which is Orion's defeat trait. Provides leadership plus four during forest battles. Melee attack plus four, five during forest battles. Um, I believe that's only for the Lord. I don't think that's particularly useful. I'm going to put that under C tier. It's just, you're not going to be fighting that many forest battles. So it's useful only for melee lords and only while you're in the forest. It's just, like, it's better than nothing. It's just not it's just not that impactful. Okay, then we've got Durthu's defeat trait, which is Tree Surgeon. Enables flaming attacks when fighting against wood elves. This is actually shit. <laughs> because... Uh, the Wood Elves currently have loads of ways that they can actually mitigate their fire weakness. Uh, most Wood Elf units don't actually have a fire weakness, and that fire attack is only for the Lord. So you have to specifically go up against somebody that's got a fire weakness, and only when fighting against Wood Elves. So it's just, you're very, very rarely ever going to make use of it. In Warhammer 3, it'll probably be more useful, because it'll uh, flaming attacks will reduce regeneration, uh, but... At this stage here, that's just not useful at all. It's just very low impact. Then we've got the Twilight Extinguished, which is the Sisters of Twilight defeat trait. Casualty replenishment rate plus 20% for the Lord, and Missile Strength plus 10%. So that only affects the, the commander of the army, not the entire army itself. So that's not 20% casualty replenishment for every single unit in the army. It's just for the Lord. So they'll, they'll heal faster. And then, of course, providing them with Missile Strength, which is completely useful, useless for the vast majority of Lords in the game, because most of them aren't Missile Units. Um, some of them are, so, you know, there's there's Wood Elf Lords, there's High Elf Lords that have Missile Attacks, um, but most of the time they're just not particularly impactful. I'm going to put this one here under B tier, because Casualty Replenishment for the Lord is fairly useful. A lot of times in my battles, my Lords do take the most amount of damage, because I try to get the most out of them. So, good Good-ish defeat trait. I'm going to put it under B tier. Then we've got Destroyer of Dryads, which is Dryker's defeat trait. Provides immune to Atholoran and awakened forest attrition. Lord's Army, Public Order minus 5, local province. Again, we've addressed Public Order minus 5. It's just not very useful uh, if you're playing on just any difficulty. Causing revolts is just a lame way of trying to um, defeat your opponents. And if you're trying to cause a revolt to bring back a faction, use heroes to do that. Pretty much every single faction can use heroes to do that. It's just a way to you know, save on supply lines. As for immunity to Atholoran attrition, that is useful if you intend to invade Atholoran, but it is hardly essential. So I'm going to put this one under C tier. It's just not that good. Then we move on to the Beastmen. Now, this one here hasn't been updated. It says Beast Scourge is the defeat trait, causes fear, but that's not what it does. Um, I believe now it, uh, they changed it so that it provides, um, I think it's Ambush Success Chance or Ambush Defense Chance. It's one of the two. I just can't remember. But whatever the case is, uh, Kazrak's defeat trait is now way better. So I'm actually going to put it under A tier because it is it is significantly better. It's, I just can't remember exactly because the list that I'm looking at here, that's incorrect. It, it used to only cause fear, but they updated him. Okay, then we've got Crow uh, Reaver. Leadership plus three when fighting against Beastman Warherds. Melee attack plus three when fighting against Beastman Warherds. Now, I'm not sure if they updated this one, but assuming that they didn't, um, that's not very much. It doesn't really provide <laughs> that much, I guess, because that's only for the Lord. Um that stat. So I'm actually going to put Malagor's defeat trait as a C tier one. It's just not that useful. Uh, then we've got Skull Slasher, Morga the Shadow Gave, Missile Resistance plus 30%. However, it's been updated. It's not 30%. It's 15% now. But that being said, 15% is still really good. I'm going to put that under A tier. So it's, you know, akin to. Um, Oh, maybe I should put it under S tier. Because it's more than what Eltharion provides. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to put that under S tier. Because everybody gets shot in this game. They're like, missile units are kind of meta. So getting uh, Morgan's defeat trait is really useful. It's just that it used to be better. So I kind of feel like it should be punished. Just because it used to be better. But it used to be one of the best ones in the game. So even even with a 50% nerf, I still think it's... Well, it's, it's borderline. It's like between S and A. It's ass. Anyway, so we've got... <laughs> anyway, we've now moved on to uh, the Brass Bull. Uh, brass Bull Glass Jaw. Uh, this provides armor-piercing weapon damage plus 20 and charge bonus plus 15%. So armor-piercing weapon damage, we've seen that many times already. It's not uncommon. Charge bonus plus 15%. It's okay. This one here, I'd say, is an, a, um, 
okay, B tier trait because it's pretty much identical with Malice with uh, Grim Ghoul's defeat trait, just providing a small amount of uh, armor piercing weapon strength. Okay, we're almost done. Now we move on to the Warriors of Chaos, Doom Slayer, which is Archeon's uh, defeat trait. It attribute immunity to psychology. Garbage. Absolute garbage. And that is just for the Lord. Most Lords have extremely high leadership or cause fear or cause terror. And so they're already immune to psychology. And considering this guy is supposed to be the biggest, baddest boss in the game, that fucking sucks. It's just not a good defeat trait at all. Uh, because psychology for Lords is just not that big of a deal. If it was for the entire army, that'd be different. But just for the Lord, they're not susceptible to psychology in the first place for the most part. Like, you have to beat the crap out of any particular Lord before fear or... Um, well, fear is always applied, unless they're immune to it. Uh, but before uh, terror is uh, comes into effect. So it's a, just a shit uh, defeat trait. Then we've got Storm Blight, which is Colex Sun Eater's defeat trait. Uh, bonus versus large plus 10, which is pretty good. I mean, there's ones here that provide more than that. So where, where's Throg? Where did we put Throg? I can't even remember. There he is. He's under A tier. So Throg provides more than Colex Sun Eater, which I find weird because Throg's a piece of shit and Colex is terrifying. Uh, so, but Colex's defeat trait is... Maybe it'll get updated in game three, but it is definitely underneath uh, Throg's defeat trait, so B tier for that. Then we've got Sigvold's defeat trait, which is Pride Assassin. Post-battle chance of stealing a magic item plus 5%. Income from all buildings plus 10% local province. That's all right. Do you know which faction benefits from that the most? Bretonia, because Bretonia doesn't have supply lines. If you're getting this defeat trait multiple times with your Bretonian lords and then putting them in a super rich province like um, like Bel Eliad um, in the south where there's gold mines is really, really good. So it's it's good, but it's <laughs> very sparsely useful you don't, you don't need to do this and by that point that um that sigvold's even under the game you usually should be pretty rich by that point so i'm gonna put this one here under c tier oh no b tier okay because i guess post battle chance of stealing a magic item is pretty good but it's just not that impactful and then we've got the final legendary lord defeat trait is gotrix this one's left last because he's the only non-starting legendary lord playable lord and i had to get my own image of him i couldn't take it out of the game uh, his defeat trait, uh, hang on, it's called, I can't remember what it's called, but I know what it does. It was on this list, which is further up. Here it is. Uh, Legend Slayer. Uh, attribute Unbreakable. So this is really useful for a few characters in this game. So really useful for Teclas if you want to make him a one-man doomstack, so you don't need to pick up the Sword of Cain. Really useful for every single vampire account. Um, being unbreakable in all situations isn't necessarily a good thing, because units that, or lords that break are sometimes harder to hit than than ones that fight to the death. Have you ever noticed that when a, a lord has broken in a melee duel, suddenly they just stop taking damage? It's due to the sort of the weird way that, that units connect with their attacks, especially with units that are not engaged with them. So sometimes being unbreakable is actually a bad thing. But I'm going to put this one here under A tier because it is a good trait. It's just not a perfect trait. You don't need it for every single legendary or just every single lord in the game. Anyway, that's my list there. Those are the S tier, the A tier, the B tier, the C tier, and the D tier. So there's very few uh, D and C tier compared to the B, A, and S. But the one that's got the most looks like it's the actual B tier there. Anyway, that's the end of this list here. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This video here took quite a while, uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll try to get a few more legendary lord based. Uh, tier list going over the next few weeks appreciate you guys and i'll see you next time fuckers bye